Hi everyone, this is Julie Turkowitz. I'm a reporter with the New York Times. I am here today in beautiful Rocky Mountain National Park with park spokeswoman Kyle Patterson. Uh, and today we are going to talk about some of the challenges that are facing uh, the park, which is now entering its second century, right? That's correct. Um, so this month marks the 100th uh, anniversary of the National Park Service. The National Park Service is the uh, is the agency that is tasked with caring for some of our most uh, treasured lands, and it was really predicated on the idea that uh, that all of our lands should be available, or not all of our lands, but our most beautiful lands should be available to everyone in the country. But there are uh, several challenges to the Park Service, and also several challenges to this park in particular. Um, some of the things we're going to talk about are climate change. Um, we're going to talk about efforts to improve diversity um, of visitors. And we are also going to talk about the rise of selfie culture and how that is affecting the park. We're going to talk about that on Facebook Live. Uh, and so I'm just going to give you guys a view of the park right now. We are at one of the visitors. And this is Long's Peak, which Kyle is going to tell us a little bit about. Um, so let's start. And can you just tell us a little bit about, you know, where we are, name of the park, all that kind of stuff, and, and you know, what are some of the most uh, special parts of this park? So we are at our Beaver Meadows Visitor Center, which is one of our most popular visitor centers right as you enter Rocky Mountain National Park. And behind us is Long's Peak, which is the highest peak in Rocky Mountain National Park at 14,259 feet. So the amazing part of Rocky Mountain National Park, there's so many amazing aspects of this park, but the diversity of the elevation. So we're here at about 7,500 feet in elevation, and then Long's Peak obviously looms in the background. And so it's a, it's a wonderful, diverse park. Thank you so much. I'm going to check one okay. technical item. <clears throat> Hi, Madison Mills. Can you tell us that we are transmitting to everyone from the New York Times and not just to you? Thank you. We're looking at Rocky Mountain National Park right now. This is Long's Peak. Madison, can you let me know that I'm transmitting to everyone? Thanks so much. This is Long's Peak. We are here in Rocky Mountain National Park. Okay. All right, so I was hoping you could actually talk a little bit about your favorite part of the park. Absolutely. That's so hard to pick my favorite part of the park, but the biodiversity in this park ranges significantly depending on the elevation that you're at. So Long's Peak, it's amazing. Our high alpine lakes are probably some of my favorite parts because we've got so many alpine lakes that are tucked away and so many of them feel like they're in a little bowl. Those are beautiful areas, but I think my favorite is the riparian montane area because that's where I... I like to see a lot of just different life, whether it's the flora and the fauna, the incredible wildlife that spends a lot of time in riparian areas, as you can imagine, with the streams and the rivers. Mm -hmm. And then just the, the, I like the feeling of being in the meadows and looking up at the mountains. And, and at Rocky, a lot of where you look is the Continental Divide, but then we mm -hmm. also have some amazing other um, mountain ranges here in the park that are separate from the Continental Divide. So really, everywhere you look in Rocky is, is truly amazing. It's one of the reasons why so many people come to enjoy this national park. And can you just remind us, what are we looking at right now? Okay, right now we're looking at Long's Peak, and Long's Peak is our 14er. So Colorado um, mountains that are above 14,000 feet, everyone calls 14er. So Long's Peak is 14,259 feet. And so it really truly is, is the crowning peak that you can see in most areas of Rocky, whether on the tundra along Trail Ridge Road, Long's Peak uh, stands out in the distance. So, you know, I would love if you could talk a little bit about some of the population trends that we're seeing in terms of visitors coming here. Uh, I know that you guys have seen a major rise in the number of people who are coming, um, but 
also, you know, what, what are some of the, what are some of the, I guess, negative consequences of that or some of the challenges of that? So Rocky Mountain National Park has seen a, a very significant increase in our visitation. Over the last three or four years, we've increased by over a million visitors. So last year alone was Rocky Mountain National Park's centennial. Mm -hmm. So we um, were in front of the National Park Service as far as celebrations. So we've been able to celebrate uh, two milestones mm -hmm. for our agency. As a result of that, um, we have also a large population along the Front Range. So we continue to see a lot of visitors that were truly the handy national park to them now, mm -hmm. which is which is great. People are out enjoying their national parks. But last year we saw a 21% increase in visitation, and this year we're up 10% from this time last year. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, again, many people are coming here loving their parks and, and doing certainly the right thing. So last year we had 4.1 million visitors, mm -hmm. and most of those visitors behaved and enjoyed their national park the best way they could. Mm -hmm. We also are seeing an increase in some behaviors that are a concern to us. So it's hard to know whether more people are just really trying to figure out the best ways to behave in national parks, and it's the same percentage. We're just seeing more mm -hmm. because we have more visitors. So um, I just want to remind everyone that this is Julie Turkwitz. I'm a reporter with the New York Times with Kyle Patterson from Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, so you're talking about some of the ways that um, folks in the park are maybe misbehaving, right? Um, can you tell me specifically w what are you seeing in terms of behavior and, and why is this a problem for, for our parks? So some of the areas that we saw last year, really a, a big concern for us was people getting closer to wildlife. Uh, we had a huge spike in the number of illegal campfires in Rocky Mountain National Park, which is obviously a big concern to us to have these human-caused fires and also to our neighbors and the surrounding communities, obviously a, a very significant concern. Fires are always prohibited in Rocky Mountain National Park. They're only allowed in front country areas, front country campgrounds that have designated fire rings. And last year and continuing this year, we're seeing a number of people that are starting fires throughout the park in a variety of locations. So that obviously is a big concern for us. We're also seeing some significant impacts of human waste in the backcountry. It's not something that people talk about. It's not a pleasant topic, but it's something that we need to continue to tackle here at Rocky as far as um, how to handle that. Not leaving toilet paper in the backcountry, um, truly taking it out with you. And so it's as we see this huge increase in visitation, those are some that we're seeing. We're also seeing an increase in dogs on trails. Mm -hmm. Dogs are prohibited on trails in Rocky Mountain National Park. So we truly believe that a national park, and particularly Rocky, visitors should be able to enjoy mm -hmm. without interactions of pets. Pets can chase wildlife. Pets can um, uh, provide um, other impacts to wildlife, spreading diseases. And also, a lot of people don't think about this, but pets can also be prey to wildlife. Species like great horned owl, bobcats, mountain lions, and so uh, pets are only allowed in Rocky where cars are allowed. And so we're seeing again an increase in um, people either not knowing, and so those are really truly the the visitors that we're trying to reach are the visitors that want to do the right thing, but they just maybe haven't been to a national park before. And then there's the other side of that: people that might not care, and so uh, obviously we'd be dealing with that with other reasons. But, you know, certainly approaching wildlife, we're continuing to try to talk to visitors about um, selfies. And so a number of visitors might feel that it's only adventuresome if they show themselves in the picture with the wildlife. And so that seems to be the reasoning that they want to come, um, is I need to get in the picture with the wildlife. Not necessarily that I can see the wildlife at a distance and I can show that I'm here in Rocky Mountain National Park having this great adventure. I feel like maybe it's not a great adventure unless they are in the photo. And so we're seeing more and more of that and have some concerns about that as well, as you can imagine. So I just want to remind everyone that this is Rocky Mountain National Park. We are here today with Kyle Patterson. And one of the things we're just talking about right now is um, the effect of selfie culture on the park. Can you specifically maybe give me one or two examples of why it's not good for someone to get very close to, say, um, 
uh, elk and, and take a picture. I mean, what's why is that dangerous for the animal and why is that dangerous for the people? Right, and, and again, because we have such amazing watchable wildlife in Rocky Mountain National Park, mm -hmm. maybe people forget that those animals are indeed wild, that mm -hmm. they're not uh, they're not tame, um, it's, it's not a zoo setting. Uh, that's part of so amazing is that you can see this watchable wildlife. Mm -hmm. In the spring, we had more and more people. Um, there's some images that we shared. There are people literally getting eight feet away from uh, cow elk. And cow elk in May have calves nearby. And you can't see oftentimes the calves because maybe they're bedded down. And so that's certainly a big concern for us is, again, um, elk can be very uh, adaptive. They can be accepting, but you never know when they might feel that a person is too close to their calf. We also have moose on the west side of the park that can be very aggressive, and we're coming up on the elk rut mm -hmm. in Rocky Mountain Park, which is the time that the bulls, elk, will gather their harems. They can also be extremely aggressive during this time of year. So continuing to remind people that wildlife is indeed wild, and we have all these great watchable wildlife opportunities that you can experience it from a distance and stay safe. And so continuing to try to engage our park visitors uh, on that, but it's, it's a wonderful opportunity at Rocky. It's one of the main reasons that people come here and have for 100 years is the amazing wildlife viewing opportunities. The other concern we have is that instead of saying, how far should I stay back? We're having more and more visitors ask us how close they can get. So right there, we need to continue to engage our visitors and that it's not about how close you get, it's that you have this wonderful opportunity to watch wildlife and you're not impacting also other people that might be there or might people that might be 10 minutes behind you and now maybe by your actions. Uh, everyone who's watching the park, we're at Rocky Mountain National Park and uh, we're gonna take some, some questions. So please, 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 um, ask your questions um, about the Park Service, about Rocky Mountain National Park in particular. Um, you know, we're in Colorado. I guess we should have mentioned that. Some people don't know that Absolutely. Rocky Mountain National Park is in Colorado. <laughs> we're about uh, two hours, an hour and a half from Denver. Um, so, so please, uh, you know, ask us what, what you want to know about the future of America's parks. Um, so one of the things that I know um, has been both, you know, a criticism internally and externally um, at the Park Service is that, you know, even though there are millions of visitors to the mm -hmm. park, generally the population of visitors don't look like America, right? I think there was a 2011 study that showed that one in five national park visitors is non-white and one in, just one in ten is Hispanic and, you know, it's one of our fastest growing demographics in the country. So can you talk about, you know, just does, does the Park Service think this is a problem and, and what Good is... Good morning, visitors. Rocky, Ooh, in 15 we're going to take a minute. <laughs> at 10 a.m., right outside... We wish we could show the park film. ...in the plaza area will be a 30-minute presentation entitled The Bear Necessities, which is about the black bears that we have here at Rocky Mountain National Park. See you there. So one of our readers is actually asking um, about elevation. Uh, can you talk about what, what elevation are we at right now? Absolutely. Part of the beauty of Rocky Mountain National Park is our range elevation. So right here at Beaver Meadows Visitor Center, we are at roughly 7,500 feet in elevation. And our highest point in Rocky Mountain National Park is what we're showing, which is Long's Peak, and that's 14,259 feet. So we've got this great breadth of biodiversity throughout that range of elevations. So, okay, so we were talking park diversity, which um, my understanding is, is a major priority for the Park Service. It is, and when Rocky celebrated our 100th last year, we looked at our three main concerns, day use, relevancy, and climate change. And truly, our concern and something we want to continue to tackle here at Rocky is our concept of relevancy, that we want mm -hmm. the park visitors to mirror society. Mm -hmm. And so certainly, uh, at Rocky, we mainly are a natural park, but we also do have a lot of cultural aspects too. And so the diversity and, and relevancy throughout the national park system is gonna change greatly depending on what part of the country that you're at. Mm -hmm. So you might see more diversity in a certain area that might be more centered in a certain part of the country. And so what we need to continue to try to do is reach 
populations, particularly along our doorstep. I mean, truly, we want to focus our efforts initially on where we think we can really have some great impacts, and we have over the last couple of years. We can continue to do better. So one of the things that we're continuing to do is reach out to schools mm -hmm. along the Front Range, the Denver metro area as well, and really try to connect with young people because um, they oftentimes it's not part of their family pr tradition or it hasn't been part of their culture to experience national parks. And so a big part of what we hope we can accomplish with a number of our partners mm -hmm. is engaging young people in their backyard first mm -hmm. so that they have this love affair with nature in general mm -hmm. and then they engage in city parks and county parks and open space in general and so that then a place like Rocky Mountain National Park, this amazing national park, can continue to uh, engage young people so that they ask their parents or their grandparents, take me up there, I want to see what this is about. So we truly are seeing that impact having some significant effects. So we're going into schools, mm -hmm. and then these kids are coming up to the park and using the park as part of their science class or their biology class, and then they're going home, mm -hmm. and they're saying to their parents who might not normally come to a national park, um, I want to take you there. I want to show you what I saw today. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing this younger generation mm -hmm. of um, diverse kids bringing their parents here. So that's really great. And part of the Every Kid in a Park program that started last fall through the National Park System is also really focused on getting kids mm -hmm. to come to Rocky Mountain National Park and national parks throughout the country whether they're seashores or memorials or monuments, mm -hmm. and they can visit these parks for free, bring their family along, and hopefully begin a love affair with the parks. And then, so we're, we're starting here with some of those steps and continuing to look at also when we have families that come here, individuals who come here, how we can continue to engage them mm -hmm. um, to fall in love with national parks. So it sounds almost like a, like a, a kid first idea, you know, hook the kids and have them bring their family. Absolutely, and it's amazing how much influence kids have on their family decisions or just wanting to talk to their families about these places. And then also continuing to try to look at maybe why aren't people coming here? Is it because they're uncomfortable? Is it because they're concerned? Is it because they haven't really been to a national park before and they want people to possibly help them through that. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're trying to have specific programs. Um, this past summer, we've been doing a number of programs in Spanish. Mm -hmm. Again, trying to reach out to maybe communities that haven't come that want to learn more about the park. Mm -hmm. And then also um, assisting different family groups on camping. Mm -hmm. Like if they've never done that before, mm -hmm. but they would love to learn about it, and maybe it seems a little um, scary mm -hmm. that we're saying let us let us help you have that camping experience so that next time you feel confident to do it uh, by yourself so you know some of it might feel like baby steps some days or just real small steps but we feel that that oftentimes has the most impact when you're really connecting with people one-on-one -on -one, um, no matter what the age that seems to be where we have uh, the most connection and so we'll continue to reach out that way as well Yes. So um, for all of you guys, all you folks out there who are on Facebook, we're looking for some really good questions about the future of the Park Service. Um, we're actually going to talk pretty soon about climate change and the effect of climate change on the park. Um, but right now we are talking to Kyle Patterson. She's been working at the park for, for 15 yes. years. Yes. Um, and, you know, one of the things, um, you know, we, we've talked about diversity, We've talked about um, about uh, the impact of people getting closer and closer to um, to animals and other you know pieces of the landscape. And we're also linking to a couple of um, items online. We just linked to a story um, about the National Park Service's efforts to um, bring in a more diverse group of readers. I believe we're going to link to something about good behavior at the park. Um, you know, if any of you guys have specific questions about how to act at the park, um, I think that that would be really useful. I think some of us just don't know, you know, can I leave a banana on the trail, right? right? Um, can I leave toilet paper on the trail? That sort of thing. People just don't know. Um, and so, uh, you know, we are here to... Let's see if we have anything. What else? What else would you like to add? You know, certainly when we talk about behavior, it is hard. As we were talking about pre
previously and there we had a hummingbird that just flew by <laughs> he wanted to see what was going on mm -hmm. is the concept of leaving no trace and that's an important thing to remember when you're in different areas of Rocky Mountain National Park it's mm -hmm. truly enjoying the area that you're in mm -hmm. and then leaving no trace that you've been there before mm -hmm. and so if people come into the park with that concept kind of in the back of their head whether it's leaving no trace of orange peels or apple cores or toilet mm -hmm. paper whether it's leaving no trace and that you might have thought, oh, this is a beautiful bouquet of flowers. I think I'm going to take this home. Well, the next person that comes behind you now mm -hmm. doesn't get to see those flowers. The pollinators don't get to also take advantage of those flowers. Um, the seeds don't get to be dispersed. So there's, so if you're taking flowers with you, you are leaving a trace of your impacts. And so that sometimes is what resonates with people. It's just some of the most basic behavior that, again, if it your first time to a national park you might not really think about things that way but that's certainly a, a good place to start and what we continue to encourage our visitors to experience the leave no trace so that when you come along a trail you might really experience this great opportunity that you don't know whether somebody has been on the trail before you and we also try to remind people with the level of visitation that we're having now if 4.1 million visitors mm -hmm. had certain behaviors or actions or took things with them what would that leave for the rest of us? So continuing to really understand that we need to be a light on our footprint and not only for our experience, but for those that come behind us, whether this year or 50 years from now. So you mentioned being light on our footprint. Um, I, a lot of people are writing in and asking, you know, selfies impact wildlife, question mark, question mark. Um, what, can, can you sort of drill down, maybe give us um, an, one specific example of something that you've seen either here at this park or that is been experienced uh, at, at other parks that, that, that really hurt or could hurt um, a specific type of wildlife. Right, so again, wildlife in Rocky Mountain National Park, depending on the species of wildlife, mm -hmm. can appear to be very used to human beings. But a lot of our wildlife are used to human beings and vehicles mm -hmm. along the sides of the road. So when people start to get out of their vehicles mm -hmm. and start to approach, like what we'll say are people are used to maybe um, being or elk are used to people being in a car and four tires but as soon as they become this two-legged thing that starts approaching them elk behavior can change drastically and so usually with selfie sticks mm -hmm. people need to get closer to wildlife in order to get themselves in the picture with the wildlife so we continue to see people approaching wildlife and then the wildlife are getting up and moving the wildlife are becoming agitated mm -hmm. and so far we've been very fortunate in Rocky and that we have not had anyone injured mm -hmm. and so we need to continue to be mindful that we don't want it to get to that point. Um, also we've got the elk rut that's right around the corner mm -hmm. and elk can be extremely aggressive. Mm -hmm. Bulls have a lot of testosterone. Mm -hmm. They're dealing and thinking about other things than humans. And so again it's trying to keep people out of the equation letting wildlife do their thing mm -hmm. that's truly what's so amazing about a place like rocky is that you get to see that if you stay back and you watch it from a distance you'll be able to see all the amazing behaviors of wildlife mm -hmm. and as we were talking about earlier this spring we had visitors over memorial day weekend who were much much too close to wildlife cows with their calves and it really, truly is amazing, quite frankly, that nothing happened. Um, and probably there will be a black bear presentation in about five minutes at 10 a.m. in the front of the Beaver Meadows Visitor Center. Next time, All are welcome to attend. And next time you come to Rocky Mountain National Park, look into those programs because they're really great. And then also, again, when people start to become more aware of what's in their camera, mm -hmm. then they start to become. Um, not uh, not focused on the things that are around them. And so there has been uh, tragedies in other national parks where people have, um, I think most recently, someone was taking a picture of themselves and uh, at the canyon and perished when they fell backwards. Again, because focusing on the camera rather than their surroundings, what we call situational awareness, um, things can go bad very quickly. And so, um, that's one of the things in a national park is it's a wild place, it's wilderness. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of amazing places here. And I think again, trying to focus on looking through the camera um, also times is the concern. So um, 
I just want to remind everybody that we are at Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado. Um, I would love, love, love some of your questions um, about the park, um, particularly about the future of the park. Um, one of the things that we are going to talk about um, coming up is um, the effect of climate change on the park. And, you know, maybe we should bring in our, our next guest. Say goodbye. And, Absolutely. And, and, you know, so Kyle's been working at the park for 15 years. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Enjoyed uh, talking with you, and um, we truly appreciate the love affair that people have with national parks and look forward to continuing to engage with all of us as to be um, the best stewards we can be of a place like this. And it's going to take a lot more than just National Park Service staff. It's going to take all of us. So appreciate the time this morning. Yeah, thank you okay. so much. Thank I really you. appreciate it. All right, we're going to show you. Tim, who we bring in our next guest. This is Paul McLaughlin. Paul is an ecologist just explaining to me that uh, has been through the ranger program also you're gonna have to bear with us because there's a bit of a height difference here um, we are going to show you the park but I think the, the big thing that we're going to talk about right now is the impact of climate change um, uh, oh someone's proposing a marriage to you so <laughs> we have a lot of really excited New York Times readers uh, so, so this is Long's Peak uh, and you know, Paul, could you just start out by talking to us a little bit about your, uh, you know, what do you do here at the park? Sure, I'd be glad to do that. So I actually wear two hats in the park. Literally, I'm wearing a ranger flat hat today. And one of my roles is playing the research coordinator in the park. So I work with a variety of researchers from universities, nonprofits, um, other government agencies that help us to study the various issues in the park and provide guidance for management. And then I also serve as the park's active, acting wilderness coordinator. So I'm able to be an advocate for keeping the park wild mm -hmm. and all the things that can entail. So um, one of the questions um, is, I'd like to know what changes they've personally seen and have to deal with due to climate change. So, so that actually perfectly um, leads me to my next question, which I was just hoping that you could talk a little bit about. Um, Maybe start with one specific uh, change in the park that you've noticed um, that, uh, that is related to climate change. What is it and how is it affecting the park? Yeah, and actually if we look at Long's Peak right now, mm -hmm. you can, for the readers, basically you might see something that looks like white dust up near the top of the peak. That is actually snow, which for those of you living in warmer parts of the country may be amazing. But starting in late August, we start getting cooler temperatures. We actually get a dusting of snow. That'll melt off. We'll have more snow come. And so we have actually a fairly long snow season here. And in fact, that snow, in effect, is a reservoir. It stores water through the winter and then distributes it through the spring and summer. Mm -hmm. And over the last 40 years or so, we've noticed that the onset of spring snow melt is starting about one to two weeks earlier. Mm -hmm. And what that means is actually that supply of snow that's piled up on the mountains starts to melt earlier, it peaks earlier, and actually by the time you get to late summer, early fall, there isn't much water left. So this obviously can have a direct impact on the plants and animals and the, the fish in the creek, but also it has an influence on human economy in the sense of the amount of water that's available for agriculture, the amount of water that's available downstream for cities. So that's one of the very tangible effects we've seen from climate change. There's um, another uh, thing that you and I were talking about, which is beetle kill. And can you talk about what that is, but also what it looks like? Um, because I, I don't know, we can't really, see, we don't see any here, do we? It's only, it's very subtle here. Um, but actually, we've had two outbreaks of bark beetles in the park. The first started in the early 2000s, and that was a pine bark beetle. Mm -hmm. And that spread throughout the park, particularly on the west side of the park. And if you were to drive through the park or hike through the park, you'd see a lot of dead pine trees, particularly the big mature ones, that were impacted by those pine bark beetles. So that was something that started because of a drought. And those beetles have actually evolved with the forest over the last 10,000 years. They're a natural part of the forest. But the influence of climate change is, is twofold. One is that we're seeing less of the severely cold temperatures in the wintertime that can actually kill a lot of the beetle larvae. The other thing is we're having longer growing seasons in the summer, and we're actually having more of those larvae survive to become bark beetles, and we've actually had more than one reproductive cycle in a year. So the total number of beetles 
is larger. It has a bigger impact on the forest. And this last beetle outbreak actually stretched all the way from Mexico to Canada and from California all the way to South Dakota. So it had a huge geographic extent. So again, it's a natural phenomena, but it's expanding at an unnatural um, scale because of some of the effects of climate change. So just a couple of readers were asking us, uh, you know, who we are. Um, I hope that the connection is, is all right, and if it's not, we'll, we'll fix that soon. Um, so, so my name is Julie Turkowitz. I'm a reporter for the New York Times. We are here in Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, I am with an ecologist named Paul McLaughlin, who is talking about the some of the effects of climate change in the park. Um, you know, please feel free to uh, jump in with your questions. Um, you, you, so you're talking about beetle kill and, and saying that because we have, because the winters have been less cold and because the growing season has been longer, uh, we, we're seeing more beetles, right? And the beetles are, are killing some of these trees. Yes. Uh, can you talk about what, what does that look like? Unfortunately, we can't really see this, what, what um, Mr. McLaughlin is talking about, but, uh, but, but talk about some of the, um, the, what this looks like. Yeah, so if you were to drive in Rocky Mountain National Park, and I'd encourage you when you have a chance to come and visit our park and a variety of other parks in the National Park System, mm -hmm. what you would notice on the roads, and particularly if you went off on the trails, is that a lot of the mature pines in the trees, were a lot of the mature pine trees in the park were actually impacted by those bark beetles. And so you'd see a lot of dead trees. Um, in some areas on the western side of the park, there's areas where 80 or 90 percent of, of the pine trees are, have all been killed in an area. Mm -hmm. And so if you focus on the, the overstory, the bigger trees, you would say, wow, all the trees have been killed. Mm -hmm. But actually, if you then shift your focus to the ground and the understory, you'd notice the little trees coming up. So obviously, the bark beetles have had a big impact on our forest, but it's also a hopeful story of the rejuvenation, the young trees that are coming up in the understory. So we have Eric who's listening from just a mile away. Hi, Eric. Thank you for listening. I'm also hearing that I'm not speaking up enough, so I will try uh, my hardest. Um, how has the park changed as a function of global warning? James wants to know. So yeah, I mean, what what is the park doing to stop this? And and I'm also curious, you know, why should a New York Times reader care about park, you know, pine beetles? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. Well, these are tangible examples of larger phenomena occurring on the landscape. You know, over the country as a whole, water supplies are an important consideration, whether it's in the Adirondacks or it's in the Rocky Mountains. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of places, the winter snows are a reservoir of water for cities and agriculture as well as for the natural resources. And so if you have a change in that accumulation of snow and when it melts off, that can have a big impact both on the natural resources and on the human uh, economy. So that's one thing to be motivated about. Another certainly is, you know, we have a lot of these natural areas that we love and value. And things like the, the bark beetles can create a dramatic change in the landscape. We can see that, and for those of us that know and love this landscape, we mourn those changes that are occurring. And so that's a tangible effect of climate change. But also we can learn about the resiliency of nature and how it can recover from some of these impacts. And hopefully that can inspire us as a species to, to act in our own ways that will help to reduce the impacts of climate change, reduce our other impacts on the natural environment so that we can continue to have this, this and other national parks as special places we can enjoy. So uh, we're gonna sign off pretty quickly. Um, I'm going to ask a pop question, uh, which is I'm curious if either of the um, Rocky Mountain National Park uh, representatives with us have a favorite book uh, about uh, the park or about the West or about, um, you know, natural lands. And I'm sort of asking this off the cuff. I didn't, uh, I didn't prepare them for this one. So <laughs> if they can't answer, it's, it's okay. I'm reading a book now that I'm particularly a fan of. Paul, do you have a? Yeah. I know, I'm trying to think. You're stumping us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, may, what we can do is we can have them uh, think about this. And then we can, we'll put it somewhere on our Facebook page. Um, you know, if, I, I think that, you know, so many of us live in cities these days, and sometimes it's hard for us to connect 
um, with uh, you know the natural beauty that is our national parks. So we're always looking for more stuff to read and, and ways to get out here. Um, let me check if there are any other questions. Um, anyone have any last questions for us? This is Long's Peak. Uh, we're in Rocky Mountain National Park. And I can mention one classic book that I recommend to your readers. Sure. Uh, there was a wonderful book written by Wallace Stegner called Mountains Without Handrails, which I think is a great description of, of preserving our natural resources and their value to humans and our society. All right. Wallace Stegner, everybody. Check it out. That's a great suggestion. I would second that. <laughs> All right. We're going um, to put the camera on. Everybody wave goodbye. Say thank you so much, New York Times readers. And make sure to um, check out some of those links that we are uh, connecting uh, or that we're putting on our Facebook page. And um, the, for those of you who are just uh, checking in, this is Rocky Mountain National This is Julie Turquoise with the New York Times signing off. Thanks, everyone.